Right. First off, welcome everyone to the uh, photo chats. If you've uh, never been here before, uh, this is a program that we do every other week. And um, it was started by John Cornicello, who's on board here back in the pandemic days. Um, he was doing two a week and kept a lot of us uh, busy and out of trouble. And then after things got back to normal life, he kind of uh, got back to normal business and it kind of kind of went on a hiatus. And then uh, John, Jeff, myself, and Holger uh, decided to bring it back. And uh, we've been beginning to talk to a lot of photographers and line up some great guests. And we have a great guest today who we'll talk about in a minute. He's a good old friend. Uh, John and I have known each other for a long time. Um, yeah, the following program on March 27th will feature Steve Gosling, an incredibly talented uh, photographer with a great sense of humor that uh, a lot of people on this uh, chat might know. On April 10th, we have Ian Plant. Ian's a photographer that I've known, kind of known exist for a while, but I ended up doing um, a trip with him to Antarctica uh, this past December, and his work is just absolutely amazing. He's a great articulator, a lot of fun to, to see his work in action, so uh, we'll have a great program with him. And then on April 24th, Dan Steinhardt, he's from Epson, but he's not going to be an Epson Dan uh, when he does a program. Dan is also a very good photographer, and we're going to feature Dano and his photography, and I think you'll be motivated by a lot of the wonderful images that he produces. Um, and then we're talking to a number of people for the May and June things, and I'll update the, this calendar and what we're doing again at the next meeting with Steve Gosling. And also, we always put these meetings online. So what happens, um, you'll... You're muted again. You're muted. Kevin, you're muted. He's not listening. Okay, I'm it. unmuted again. For some reason or other, just, I'm, I always have some. Last week we had power failures. Now I'm unmuted. It's time to get a new computer. <laughs> hey, Kevin, it's your hitting the space bar. Yeah, I was going to say, don't touch the I, space I saw bar. your hand move to the space bar. No, yeah, I was trying to change the slide. Normally that's how I change my slide. Well, anyway, photopxl.com is a website I started when I left Luminous Landscape, and uh, a lot of you know about it, but if you want to be notified of these meetings in the future, go there, and in the upper right corner, you can sign up uh, as a member. It costs nothing, but you know, you'll go into the mailing list and also be able to get some benefits, too, especially if you would like to contribute to help make PhotoPXL a stronger site. I keep it a free site, but we live off the membership contributions and uh, we've been finding very many of our readers have been very generous and allowing us to continue our existence this way, so it's very nice. Um, I do have some other workshops coming up I want to make a note of. In May, I still have some room on my Faroe Islands workshop with Steve Gosling. The Palouse workshop, I have one spot left on my second workshop. It's a workshop with only five people. Uh, you'll uh, be overdosed on landscapes. You'll shoot from dawn to dusk, and uh, it's a heck of a fun time. We end up in a big suburban vehicle. We go where no other workshops can go. I have a lot of ins and outs with uh, the farmers there, and uh, it, it's a marvelous photographic weekend. In August, I have an expedition yacht with 12 passengers, and I still have a couple spots left on that. Uh, if you want an amazing trip to a new location that nobody's been to before in Greenland, that's where we're going. We're doing a whole brand new fjord system. Uh, with a number more landings and communities and other things that we can see, not to mention glaciers and giant icebergs. And then I have two more fine art printing workshops, which we just finished one over this past weekend. Uh, Jeff was part of it, uh, one in May um, and then one in October. So uh, keep those in mind if you would like to be part of those. That would be great. Um, a few rules. When we get started here, we're going to mute everybody, and we ask that you uh, stay muted so that uh, with all these people online that nobody talks over each other. Um, if you want, you can use the chat uh, section to ask questions. Um, either John or Jeff will monitor those. And then when we get to the question point of view, when when, when John Hartman's done his presentation, uh, we'll bring those questions to light and you can unmute your, your uh, microphone and ask the questions personally. And then afterwards, you can unmute yourselves and uh, you can stay online. And a lot of times we just have a kind of a general session. When John's done his program, we'll probably stop the recording. So there'll be a point where we're no longer recording. 
Uh, recordings of this will be available in a few days. Normally I go through and edit out a few things, put everything together on top of some of the other things I'm doing. And uh, then we're set to go. So uh, without further ado, whoops, let's talk a little bit about John Hartman. Uh, John has graciously uh, given us his time today. Um, I've known John since the 70s. Uh, when we both had studios, we were very big into uh, uh, the portrait mar portrait side of things and essentially marketing and management and how to make uh, uh, more money by actually being better marketers. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. John held a, a course he can tell us about, um, and he, he would be... Uh, hundreds of people show up at this event every year and it was a marvelous amount of fun john uh, put on great programs motivated everybody and uh, was a pretty big deal um, but lately and a few years ago i noticed that john was doing light painting and he attended one of his light painting courses and i know of only a couple light painters and what john was doing was absolutely amazing with different lights flashlights regular lights and different things he would paint cars houses still lifes, um, all sorts of different things. And we're gonna get a dose of that today. And uh, number one, it's been a privilege to keep John and have John as a friend. We have a lot of adventures together that we can talk about, but as an amazing, talented artist, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun to see what John has to share with us today. So without further ado, I'll uh, introduce John. John, when I stop my screen share, uh, you should be able to go in to yours and do a screen share, and the program is all yours. Let me put everybody on mute first. Let me figure out how to do that. Hold on just a second. Um, ask all, mute all. So, okay, everybody should be muted, I hope. And John, um, please go ahead. John has to unmute. All right, John, you have to unmute yourself. I muted you. About that. It's nice there to work you with go. a professional, right? Yeah, we got you now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kevin. It's good to, good to be here. And uh, it's nice to see a lot of, of uh, faces and names I haven't seen for a while, some people that I don't know. I'm glad that you're all here. And um, we're going to uh, kind of breathe through a little bit of an introduction to this thing called light painting. Um, June 6th, in two months, less than two months, I'll have uh, 50 years of own studio ownership. I'll open, I opened my studio on June 6, 1974. And as Kevin said, early on, I started in the portrait world. And uh, um, well, about 20 years ago, I started seeing that the industry was changing. And um, I was able to get that insight through these uh, marketing boot camps that I had because I took uh, a lot of uh, the pulse of the industry then. And uh, started realizing that, you know, uh, I mean, I've never done anything but photography. It's the only job I've ever had. I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. I've never had a paycheck. Um, I've never had a side job. I've never had a wife who supported me or family money. So I've been doing this, um, you know, with the idea of uh, making a living at it. Now I don't need to do that anymore. So I'm having fun. And uh, people ask when I'm going to re retire. And I just say people retire to do exactly what I'm doing right now. So I would be taking pictures even if I was retired. So I'm doing both now and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. But um, if I can, I'll try to get to my presentation. Let's see. How does that look? Are we there? You're there. There you go. You're all there. Okay. Very good. Okay. So obviously... Uh, this is, light painting is not intuitive. The first time I ever saw a light painting, I, as my the photographer brain said, that's really cool, but how do they do that? And I think, you know, in, a, in the portrait world, you can look at a photograph and you can see the background is out of focus. So you can say, okay, they open up their, their, uh, their lens. It's a long lens because there's a compression value to the background. I can see there's round catch lights in the eyes. So they must use a round main light of some sort, an umbrella or something. And you could pretty much say, yeah, I could do that. And the first time I ever saw light painting, I said, that's really cool. I have no idea how they did that. And it was really a lot of fun. So I wanted to explore and, and go through it. But I went into, if you go into Google and you say, you type in light painting, this is what you get. Um, and I scrolled down to like 20 different pages and I didn't see anything 
in there that was anything about what, you know, at least the light painting that I do. And that's to say that this isn't light painting. It's just not the stuff that, that excited me, the stuff that, that got me interested in it. But that's, uh, you know, that's what the world thinks of. Most of the world anyway, thinks of as painting with light. Um, my definition of light painting is a little bit different. And it it's simply this. It's the, uh, the the process of adding continuous light to individual areas of a scene and then putting them together into a single picture that creates a lighting look that you just can't get uh, any other way. Um, you know, you, you cannot create an image like this with, I don't know how many spots and pin lights and things that you have. You just, it, it doesn't, you just can't do that. And so it allows for uh, a lot of creativity in a lot of different ways photographically and it can be done certainly through you know for uh, commercial purposes or just for fun so and I know that some of you are um, you know retired or some of you have other things going on you just like to take photographs so this doesn't necessarily you know it's not a it's not a, a lesson in commercial photography it can just be for fun um, as Kevin mentioned uh, the first there's not a lot out there in in, in what I call interesting light painting, but he published an article in Luminous Landscape in uh, 9, 2013 by a fellow by the name of um, uh, Harold Ross. And I, I, his was the first photographs I looked at and I said, that's really neat. I want to figure out how to do that. And so um, I had him, uh, I went to his workshop and got some ideas and, and uh, he kind of, you know, lit the fire underneath me for this. And, you know, he, he does a lot of still life things um, and it's just beautiful work. Uh, as a commercial photographer, I look at things and say, well, how can I make money at this? You know, I want to be able to get something out of this other than just artistic satisfaction. So I started looking around and seeing other, uh, other people, what they were doing with light painting. Uh, another fellow by the name of Eric Curry out of California wrote a book uh, about this and his, he did grand scale projects like this. And, you know, there are hundreds of photographs and I thought that's that's really neat. There's some things in there that I could take from that and I could add to the things that I learned from Harold. And, you know, he just does these incredibly big projects that are, um, that, you know, just have hundreds and hundreds of photographs as well. Um, I don't know that he's still active anymore, but he and Harold and I, from what I understand, are all about six months apart in age. So we're from the old school, but we have a, um, uh, I got I got well uh, really interested in what Eric was doing. Um, another fellow that maybe some of you have heard of, maybe not. His name is Mark Bryant. He's from Missoula, Montana, and Mark is, in my opinion, one of the finest all-around photographers that I know of. He can do portraiture, he can do teams, he can do um, commercial photography, architectural photography. Uh, he does, you know, and does light painting in a way that he can make some money at. He, these are, he does some personal projects such as this, but he also does this kind of stuff where if you look at that and you say, oh, that's a nice, you know, a nice interior, but there's so much light painting that going on here, but you don't know. Um, and his work is just phenomenal as well. So there are people out there that are doing just not a whole lot. And so I kind of took this bull by the horns and um, the very first project I ever did was a friend of mine who has owns a bunch of exotic cars and uh, I did his uh, Ferrari in his garage and not really knowing what I was doing. And uh, <laughs> it ended up winning, um, going to the, to the uh, World Cup in 2014 for uh, photography. And, you know, it's one of those things like winning the Olympics at age 16, you know, you know, you're never going to do it again, but um but at anyway, it was it was a lot of uh, it was really interesting to see how that is being uh, light painting is being taken now by the industry, at least the 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 end the end the part of the industry that I'm in right now, which is the professional photographers. So what all, what all things can be light painted? This is the very first light painting I ever did, even before I took Harold's class. Just uh, some orchids, uh, cautioning with flowers when you're doing when you're doing this kind of stuff. Flowers move. And uh, you have some real problems with positioning if you're doing multiple exposures. But uh, that was the very first thing I ever did. This is, you know, you can do food photography, whether you're doing it just for yourself or I've done some commercial jobs for restaurants. And, um, you know, it's it's just a lot, puts their, puts their product in a little different kind of light than typical restaurant photography. Um, automobiles is a big part of what I do um, because I've learned that commercially, 
um, guys who have toys like this, they only have iPhone shots of their of their toys, and they would love to have stuff like this. Um, and they have the means to, you know, not only hire me, but also to be able to put large, uh, large images in their man caves. So uh, you can do other things. There's also a collector, a lot of collectors right now of, of old musical instruments, people my age who, who think that they are, you know, they were they used to be want to be rock and roll stars back in the 60s and 70s now have, in, in lieu of being a real star, they have man caves full of guitars and drum sets and things. And those kind of things can be uh, light painted as well. Um, on the commercial end, you can light paint buildings to create looks that just don't exist any other way. Uh, certainly, um, you know, just taking a picture of it, it's not a spectacular building, but uh, there are four campuses of this the school and they hired me to do, uh, they, they hired me to do each of the buildings. It was a lot of fun. This was another, the COVID project where I didn't have to be inside. Um, even interesting, fun little things like this. Uh, those of you that live in the South won't understand this, but there's uh, actually people, my neighbor down the street who creates snow sculptures like this. Uh, in the wintertime every day and he knocks them down and he starts the next one in a day or two. So he just does these things all over the place for no money. That's him up there in the upper right-hand corner, but beautiful stuff. And it doesn't photograph real well, just in plain daylight. But when you add light to it, it you create some very, very interesting looks. And uh, so I did a whole series of things of his and because uh, he's not getting paid for this. So I made some some images for him, put them on postcards and things and uh, note cards and and I, I I gave him the proceeds. So at least he has some kind of, I mean, let's talk about art that goes away in an hour or a day. You know, that's what he's, this is, this is what he does. Um, you know, you can do interesting other types of things. This is just a project we did for an art class at the university. Um, you can do light painting with a light hanging on a drone. I did this one uh, a couple of years ago. It's a kind of a neat little area about 60 miles from 50 miles from where I live. And uh, I just uh, hung the light on a drone and moved it around, made about 15 or 20 different exposures. And uh, it creates a look that, again, just doesn't exist in real life. Okay. I've always, often asked if you can photograph people. And yes, indeed, you can. Uh, they can't move as you're doing this. Uh, there's some secrets to doing it uh, so that, you know, you don't get any movement. But the, the 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 main thing is that, you you know, they have to be completely motionless. They have to be either seated or reclining. You can't have them standing or, you know, being unsupported in any way because even the slightest movement can, can cause problems. Um, another big commercial product for me is motorcycles because guys, Again, in, I, I say guys because I don't know I've ever photographed a woman with a motorcycle, but there are uh, many guys out there who, you know, just they would love to have an image like this uh, for their man cave. And so it's been very, very uh, successful in that end. And uh, I do uh, some work for companies that 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 make buildings. This is, a, believe it or not, a second home, um, not far from where I live right now. And that's, uh, we did that with a single like a 18 inch, um, what do they call them? It's a Godox, a little like a light wand kind of thing. And you can't imagine that they could be, you could do it like that, but that's all it was, one tiny little light. Um, I have photographed a number of different aircraft over the time, some jets, some biplanes, some, uh, you know, just uh, some bush planes, variety of different planes. People like, again, they have, the means to do this so they have the mean and they also have big hangers that you can hang the photographs in so usually i try to most of my images get printed at 50 to, to 100 inches so um, you have to have a space for them um, another uh, higher job where somebody wanted me to do some photographs interiors and you know this is done obviously photographing the the daylight at one time of the day and then just we went out to dinner and uh, came back and it was dark. And so I used the light painting to, to create the rest of the image. And you can even, even light paint sweet potatoes. <laughs> My wife found this under our sink and uh, she was gonna throw it away. And I said, oh no, no, this is a great subject. So we even light painted a sweet potato. Uh, a lot of the you know, first question that you ask is what do you need? What do you need to do this? Well, first of all, you don't need a whole lot and it's not very, um, even the professional tools I have don't cost very much, but if you 
if you use, uh, you can do, you know, with a lot of think times, you can do things that you already you already own. But it, this, uh, the the upper left hand image is that Godox image I was telling you about that I lit that big huge uh, home with. Um, the flashlight on the right is uh, for small objects, so still lifes and food and that sort of thing. And I put a, a little adapter, a little diffuser on it that Harold Ross sells. And then I have a um, a smaller, like a four by five or five by six uh, panel in the lower left um, for detail work, like in automobiles, a steering wheel and so forth. And then this flat panel here on the right, that looks like a ping pong panel. It's about the same size as one. And that's created, that's made by Savage. I don't know that they make it anymore. They make a square one now, but it's it's not too too dissimilar from this. And all of these provide different types of light. Um, and and, and uh, the, basically that's you know pretty much most of the pieces that I use. Photographically, you don't need a whole lot either. Um, you know, you have to have a sturdy tripod because the camera cannot budge. As soon as you move it, even the tiniest amount, you're gonna have registration problems. And uh, so it's important that the camera is not touched at all during the photo shoot. So a sturdy tripod um, manages to help you out. And there are some things you, that you will only learn through experience. Like a friend of mine was doing a shoot, um, had a really heavy duty tripod and he went out and did the whole shoot and he came back and he's, he's assembling the photographs. He found that they're all out of whack and they were totally out of register. And he realized what happened is what his tripod was actually move, sinking into the dirt while he was shooting. So he had uh, tremendous registration problems. The only thing you need is a camera with a bulb setting um, because you're not going to be timing your exposures. You have to be able to open and close them randomly and at will. And so a bulb setting is a, is a necessary thing. Most cameras have this. A lot of them are hidden out in the menu. You know, you'll roll through your shutter speed and you can't find them. But the bulb setting is actually there. Sometimes you have to go into a setting that says add T and B, and then you can have your bulb setting. Um, you don't need a long, fancy lenses, a 24 to eight in the eight. This range, um, I don't know that any of the images I use, I use anything wider than a 24 uh, equivalent. And nothing, hard, rarely anything longer than an 85 equivalent. Um, so that's all you really need. <laughs> Excuse me. And then you have to be able to trigger your shutter remotely. You can't touch the camera to click, trick it. So you can have a, you can have a, a cable, an electronic cable release. You can use a um, uh, trigger through um, your uh, tether to your computer or to, um, I use a, a, a phone trigger to a Pluto trigger that, that uh, trips my camera. And then you also have to have the ability to look at the images remotely as well. You cannot look at, look at or touch the back of the camera and you need a bigger image to be able to see the file with anyway. So I usually, I, I shoot everything to an iPad now. Um, ideally, the best thing to do is to shoot it to a, uh, to a laptop and to your raw viewer. But when you do that, that gives you by far and away the best image. But um, it's fussy to do it that way. So now I just use the Wi-Fi and have it transferred to a small um, iPad, which works out just fine. And I know for sure if I've overexposed or underexposed, I can tell by the image whether or not I'll be able to pull it back um, or push it forward. And, you know, if I'm in, in all in uh, concern about it, I'll just shoot another one. Camera setup is pretty simple as well. Um, I use the base exposure. I want the minimum amount of noise that I can in the camera. Um, so I use, you know, if you have, if your base exposure is 200, then use that as well. But 100 or 64, somewhere in there, you want to have it as, and that, that also allows you to use the long, a longer shutter speed. Um, shutter speed has to be on bulb. And um, because you're going to ask, uh, you're going to have that, sh those shoots start and stop uh, differently on every single image. I want these to be commercial sharp images. I don't want any out of focus areas in the image at all. So I, uh, I use a medium format camera, so I, 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 I have my aperture at f22, which is about the equivalent of a, a 11 or 16 on a full frame uh, camera. So you, if you're using full frame, you can use f16. But again, you want to have it like that because it's going to give you uh, not only the, the most depth of field, but also those longer exposure times. 
you don't need that to do this because you're going to white balance your raw files but if you want to see what they look like you know a 5500k uh setting on your white balance will give you pretty much what most lights these days will show so it, it'll be fairly accurate you'll you won't have any weird color tones or anything and then of course you want to always capture in raw um because there's just too many things you need to do to adjust these that a JPEG just isn't going to work. Uh, workflow is pretty simple as well. Uh, actually, I use I have always have someone with me. I don't ever uh, try to do all this by myself. So I have I'm the one doing the lighting, and I have someone else who clicks the camera for me. That that person opens and closes the shutter using the bulb setting on my command. So I'll say open and they click it to confirm it. They say the word open as well. And then I, when I do the lighting is just about when I'm ready to be done, I'll say close because I know that it's going to be another half to three quarters of a second before they actually close it. So I wait till I'm almost done and I say close. When you do it like that, you have the minimum amount of ambient light coming in and polluting the rest of your image. So you want to be able to, uh, you know, with, say, a lot of people say, well, I, I just want to just put on 10 seconds. Well, <clears throat> if you need a 12 second exposure, you got to go back and do it again. Or if you need a seven second exposure, then you have three seconds of ambient light going in and polluting the rest of the file. And you don't want to have that either. So it's best to just do it that way. And it, yes, it, it's, it's, it is possible to do it on your own, but it's a lot better to have have someone along come, in, come along with me. And if I, if I have a client who is, you know, I'm photographing his Ferrari or something, and he's there actively pushing the button for me. You know, they get the, they get involved with it. So they get into it, and it's kind of a fun thing for them as well. Then you have to be able to look at that image somehow um, wirelessly, trigger it, and review it. So the triggering part is done um, with my phone app that goes to my Pluto trigger, which is the thing that uh, sets my trigger off. But a lot of times... Most cameras don't have that issue. You can trigger it directly from your uh, from your iPad. Um, mine, for some reason, Hasselblad does not allow you, or Focus anyway, the Hasselblad app does not allow you to shoot on bulb. I don't know why that is, but it, it that's just a fluky thing, and they don't, they don't have no plans of making that happen. So a Pluto trigger has is the only device that allows me to do that uh, on that particular setup. But you have to be able to look at, trigger your pictures, and view them on on, uh, on your screen. Um, generally, I'll try to make several passes each time because, you know, you might look at it initially and say, oh, that's good. But then once you start looking at the finished image in your on your computer, you'll realize, oh, that wasn't that great. So if you have three or four versions of that same look, you know that you're going to your bases are going to be covered. And then I think early on, it's important to actually keep a physical track of what you shot and which light was used because every light that you use has a different color we're going to talk about that but you also want to make sure that you don't get through you know photographing a, a very expensive car for a, a big client and find out that you forgot to photograph the uh, the, the the rear hubcap so there's a number of, of uh, ways of making that happen one of which is experience but prior to that getting that experience it's important to be able to um to, uh, to keep track of it, maybe write it down even in advance so that you have a, a record of it. Make sure that you check them off as you finish the images. And then um, understand that no matter what happens, if you bump the camera, you are hosed. You cannot continue on. You have to start over because if you think, well, I can just move, you know, I can just move everything over a couple pixels, you know, that's fine. Well, if you're, if you're shooting a car with, a, say, a 35 millimeter lens, if you move the pix if the pixels shift two two pixels in the middle of the frame they're going to shoot they're going to sh shift eight pixels on the outside of the frame so no matter what you do you're never going to be able to get them out and get them lined up so it's really important just you know i've had photographers who put yellow tape around the tripod just so they don't trip around them and i have another photographer who, who from the the bottom of a post where you put the weight on your tripod he puts a little at red led light to kind of spreads a little bit of light around the tripod base so that, you know, again, nobody steps on it or gets too close to the camera. But it is a rule that you have to follow and follow. Um, you only have to do it once before you realize, you know what, that Hartman guy was right. <laughs> How do you get proper exposure? And there's no way to light meter this or anything like that. So there's a number of ways you can do it. One of which is to create 
a uh, first of all, you create a base exposure. And basically, if it's an outside photograph, a motorcycle, a car, a, an airplane, a, a building, I create a base exposure because I want to bring some of that image back into the image a little bit later. Uh, you can't light all the foreground and all the background with artificial lights. And sometimes you have to bring in some natural light there. So I basically shoot um, a base exposure, which underexposes the, the scene, but allows me to bring that some of those areas back if I need to do that. And then there's a rule I have and and, uh, and nobody's um, nobody's called me on this, but I like to have a seven stop rule. And that is that if you, if the light that you have on your subject is seven stops brighter than the ambient light, then it doesn't matter what how much ambient light you have. You just have to have a light that's bright enough. Uh, typically, um, it, it doesn't have to be completely and totally dark. Remember, you're only making anywhere from three to 10 second exposures at F22. So if there is a little bit of ambient light, you're not going to get a lot of bleed on it. But if, and I've done, I'm actually light painted a car right under a street light once and it works, you know, it's fine. You just have to have the light very close to the image and make sure that there's plenty of light on it. Um, so, and that's the, basically you can, you can do testing if you're doing a, a sunset shot, you know, as the light fades, you can, bring your lights across and start making tests until you don't, uh, until it's dark enough where you're not seeing any ambient light. But seven stops is a pretty good, uh, pretty good rule. And then the closer the light is, um, the shorter the exposure and also the softer the light. So it's important to understand that you can get a soft light even from a small light source, as long as that light source is close. And because the light is moving, you're going to get a very soft look over a long or a much bigger area, which is in my opinion, the advantage of doing uh, LED lighting, uh, continuous lighting over flash. And then you can also, of course, use your, your computer or your tablet for the proper exposure. You can adjust your, uh, you know, in your mind, you know, okay, I can pull this back if it's a little hot. Keep in mind that you don't wanna, you wanna always have, you know, overexposed specular highlights if you're photographing a car or something other that's shiny. But, but generally, you know, you can start off playing around with your lights and you're going to find that you, for the vast majority of your images are going to be in that three to 12 second range. Another thing you have to do is if you have multiple lights is you have to white balance each light. And when you do that, um, every light has a different color temperature, a slightly different color temperature. So you have to click balance using a gray card or a color checker passport to bring all your lights to a standard. And you just click a gray card as you do it you only have to do this once because then what you can do is you can create a preset in Lightroom or, or in Adobe Camera Raw or in Capture One. And uh, that allows you to create custom presets that you can continue to use in your future projects. Uh, it's easier, it's fussier to set up, but it's easier to do. And I have a video, a link to a video that I'll post at the end of the pr presentation that you, shows you how to do this. Um, but again, you can do it in, in all the major um, raw processors. The other thing that's important is to kind of determine lighting direction. Um, you know, the main light, in my opinion, uh, you know, light painting is not reality. So you can create whatever kind of light source you want. But to me, the most natural place for light placement, a main light placement is slightly above or maybe a slight angle, but not straight on from the camera. Uh, and then you can add accent lights as desired, just as you would if you were lighting a portrait or a commercial shoot. And then the biggest issue I see with most people who try to do this is they they light everything. And then when they when you get it done, it looks like it's shot with a flash on camera because you don't want to overfill. Uh, you want to leave some shadowing in there because that's the whole point of what light painting is. The John, editing part, yes. There's a question in the chat that kind of fits right here. Do you okay. have a look in your mind before you start or does it come together organically in, in your post work? Do I have a do I have a what in mind? A finished look in mind before oh. you start a light painting. Um, yes and no. You know, I I kind of know what I'm looking for, and after again, I've done I don't know about 300 or so of these over the last 10 years, and so I I, I get a a feel for what it's going to look like. But the really fun part about it is you really don't know what it's going to look like until it's all done. And to me, that's kind of like a throwback to the film days where you took your picture and you crossed your fingers. And then you waited two weeks until you got your proofs back, you know, and so that's a 
Uh, that's a, it's a good question. It is important to have a general idea about what you want to do. And certainly you want to have a general light direction in mind so that you're, you're lighting. If you look at my, um, if you look at all my still life photographs, you'll see the light is coming from the upper right-hand corner. And the reason that is, is because I'm right-handed. So it's easier for me to use my right hand to light most of my, most of my pieces. If I was left-handed, I'd probably have the light coming from the left hand as well. Great, so thanks. first, Thank you. Is that, I hope that helped. Thanks helps. David Lawrence, but thank you. Okay. Um, you want to light, you want to wrap white balance all your raw files as, as part of the processing. So you're going to be photographing with different lights. So you're going to have to keep track of which lights you use with which image. And then if you created those custom presets and you can just apply those presets to all those in as a batch and they're all automatically white balanced. So every light that you're using is properly white balanced. Then the, the second the thing I go through is I adjust the exposure. Generally, I only have to use the highlight slider um, just to get the highlights where I want them. Um, you generally don't have to use the exposure control or the shadow control, um, but I want, I want to process that file and not have to do anything to it once it's in Photoshop. I do want to process the files out to full-size JPEGs. Um, some people say, well, why don't you do TIFFs? Because they're bigger. And, and and they don't, they provide in this particular type of work provides zero uh, advantage to a uh, printing. I understand there are some reasons why you might want to use TIFFs, but for this type of work, uh, JPEG is just fine. And if you're nervous about them, then just process them out as PSD files. But you just have a much bigger file if you do that. Um, then that create that base exposure that we that we shot. Um, I, I do that and I add a white mask so it turns totally black. I'm not going to use it right now, but that's going to be the base from which we build all the other images. So then I open my first file and I use my lasso tool to select just the lighted part of the image. So if my light is in the photograph, I just lasso around that so it's not, you know, the light is not in the picture. I don't want to put the whole image in because if I do that and start stacking millions of pictures together like this, you're going to have a gigantic file. So uh, just I just select a little bit of it uh, with a zero pixel feather, and then I um, I copy that image, Command C or Control C, and close the file. And then um, and then so I go back to that original file to the um, to the uh, the base exposure file, and I paste it in, paste it in place. And I add a black mask to that. So then what I can do is I can set the blending mode to lighten. And that way, only thing the only thing that shows up on the image is anything that's lighter than something that's already there. And then I use a brush to soft, uh, with a white, white uh, foreground to brush that into taste using a low flow, about 10%, 10 to 15%. So uh, it sounds complicated but it isn't i have all this stuff automated on action so it's a lot faster but basically this is the this is the the workflow and i just repeat that with all the other files um and then at the very end then i can bring that base exposure up it can either brush in certain areas of it if i want or i can take that that white mask that and i can start lowering the opacity of it to bring in the whole file it just it just depends on what it is that you want to bring back so again, that most important concept though for a successful light painting is to make sure that you understand that direction of light. Um, that that's the most that's the thing that makes the image look um, I won't say realistic because light painting is not realistic. But then what in photography is realistic, right? As soon as you switch from a 50 millimeter to a 35 millimeter, you've distorted something. As soon as you make a black and white photograph, you've distorted something. So you know, light painting, oh, it's not real, it's fake. Yes, it is, just like photography. <laughs> so here you can see that, you know, basically the image looks like it's, the most of the lighting is from the right side. You can see based on the shadow from that uh, that knife, the bread, the highlighting on the on the bread, the brighter light on the right side of the, of the wine glass, indicating that there's a more of a light coming from that area. However, if you look closely, you can say, well, that the, the grapes are lit from the left side. And so there's kicker lights coming in from the on the wine glass and also on the bottle. Same thing. But those are secondary lights, not main lights. Um, I'll go back here. With vehicles, I try to, I just, I want to look that looks like a, there's a 22 foot softbox right over the top of the vehicle. And so you, you do that by creating what I call a grounding shadow. If you look on the, 
Now, if you look on the ground, you can see that that shadow uh, cast by the car indicates that the light was shot from straight above. And that's created just by using one pass all the way around. And then, you know, you can add in all those other um, other textured lights to add the, add the uh, kicker lights, to add the, uh, the highlighting, the steering wheel, all that other stuff at some other, at, at a later time. Same here, the light coming from straight above, casting that shadow directly below. You can't really light off to an, a side of, of one of the, uh, of, a, of a big project like this. Uh, I just discovered it just looks a lot better if you're lighting it from above because it does create texture and shadowing on along the side of the of the device too. Here you can see that you know if you look at the shadowing, the of the on, on the pistol um, on the uh, bullets, you can see that the shadowing falls from the upper right to the lower left with some kicker lights in there as well. Here again, straight you can tell the direction of light based on the shadow of the motorcycle, but there's like 30 or 40 photographs in, in this that lighting that are lighting all the other um, pieces. And here again, you can see that light coming directly above. Um, and uh, and yet there's all kinds of other lights on there. There's lights on the tires, there's lights in the interior, there's lights on the building, there's lights all over the place. But the main direction of light is it, it indicated here is from straight above. Um, this is kind of a, how the images are built together. Each one of these that light that pops in is a single and separate exposure. So you can kind of get an idea about, you know, how this is done. In the end, I'm still going to have a look of the light coming from pretty much directly above, but you can see all the lights that are illuminating the chrome of the vehicle here. And um, it does not look like you couldn't do this with any kind of a single light source or even a multiple light setup. But uh, that guy um, is a photographer friend of mine and he's get, he's, he's, he says, I'm getting too old for this stuff. So I want to get rid of this bike, but he wanted a nice photograph of it first. So wanted to make sure that uh, that chrome of that big dog really showed up. This is another, this is a, a build just kind of showing all the different layers in Photoshop. So there's that base layer that's got the mask on it. Now I'm just adding individual uh, images um, brushed in to the light specification that I wanted. And then you can see that as you add them up, um, you know, the, the the finished image is going to look, you know, relatively normal, but you can see that there's a tremendous amount of individual lighting that goes on here. And you, again, it's just a way of creating a look that just is not, um, it's just not possible in any, by any other ma ma method of image creation. So this was uh, done at a, uh, actually at the Iola car show grounds in not far from where we are. And I'm gonna, I did this during, as a project during the uh, car show. Um, and then we came down, had a reveal the next night. So that's what that, that's what that looks like with all those different layers added. Um, and interestingly, I just, just going to throw this out because um, I, the, in a professional photography world, there's a, there's a, I belong to a group called the American Society of Photographers and they have, um, their, their highest award is called a fellowship and you have to write a paper and explaining how, you know, your work has changed over the years and what, you know, what the images that you submit for competition, how they have kind of led toward, uh, you know, where you are in your, at this point in your career and so forth. It's a big project. You got to submit, I submitted these images, uh, 25 of them on 24 inch metal prints. And, um, and when the judge, you get, if you, and finally, after my third try, I got the, I got uh, the, the fellowship, but these are the images that, and I, I when I, I guess the, the thing I like ab about it, oops, I'm going to keep going. Sorry. Um, what I, I like about this and not the fact that I, I got the thing is like, okay, that's fine. But uh, that light painting is finally get some recognition in the professional world. So the, I'm just going to breeze through these, but these are the images that were part of that fellowship. So uh, bring that through. And again, most of these are probably anywhere from 20 to 60 different photographs. Some of them were, were uh, paying clients. Some of them were, a couple of them were done at workshops. Um, Texas school I teach out every year. This is the one that we did when Kevin was there and down in Atlanta. 
And that was that was a big project, Kevin. I think that was about 200 photographs because they wanted each, each one of those bushes was lit up and each column in the building and everything is pretty yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. You had uh, lights on a lights on a big stand and you were sweeping the building and turning lights on and off in the house. It was you have yeah. no idea how much work it is to do, but it is so much fun. So it, it's a blast because it's it allows and it truly is light painting. You're painting with light. And that's what's neat about it. Just like an, a, a and an artist has a painter has a, a blank canvas and he starts and he starts adding things to it. That's exactly what we're doing here. And that's what makes us so much fun. So anyway, you get an idea anyway of what, uh, what that was all about. Um, if you want to know what my tool set is, I've got a, 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 you can either type this all in, or if you want to you touch camera, you can take a picture of the QR code. <laughs> and it there's a button at the bottom of the page. Just scroll to the bottom of the page. It says, see John's tool set or something like that. You click on that and it'll give you the, all the photo, all the lights that I use and links to them. Um, I think most of them are active now. Every time I set them up every once in a while, somebody, they, they'll discontinue it or something. If that's the case, then let me know and I'll be glad to help you out. But that's, uh, it, it, that's a good way to, you know, if you want to see what the lights I'm using are without having me have to describe each one during this presentation. Also, if you want to figure out how to white balance your lights, I have uh, a video on how to do that. And it's set up in, uh, it's set up in, uh, I think it's in Lightroom, but works exactly the same way in Adobe Camera Raw. And I'm not a Capture One user, but I'm sure it works very similarly as well, just to create a, a preset so you can apply those presets to the image. And um, it's pretty, once it's up, it's real easy to do. It's a fuss factor to get it in, but that's why I made the video. Um, for anybody that might be more interested in pursuing this beyond just this one hour presentation I did and want to find out exactly how it's done, I did, my COVID project was to create a, uh, a video series on how to do this from A to Z. And so I put together 25 uh, videos in 4K, well scripted, um, well produced on how to do all the setup, uh, organization, and um, um, and then actually actually videotape me um, doing a house, doing a, a car, a motorcycle, an airplane, a still life, and then showing the editing of each of those as well. The, the the it's a subscription thing you you subscribe for your life you get into it and once you're there you can click there's an action set shows you and then I show you how to use that action set that automates most of the project most of the workflow and there's a little booklet that you can download and then each one of these tabs as you open them up gives you introduction to what everything is making the getting all everything all set up um, using actions. Um, creating, you know, processing, adding a sky, if you want to add a sky, um, lots of different things. And then I did the projects, a still life, aircraft, architecture, a car, a motorcycle, so forth. And then I also uh, showed about 25 different build videos that I did showing how I put these all, all together. So if, if you're all interested and want to do that, I do have a, uh, in this case, oops, sorry. Um, I have a, uh, if you want to click on this, this just gives you get you to that the the informational page about the classroom light painting class in the video series. And uh, if you decide you want to do it, then um, I'll give you a, I've got a little thing for, uh, set it up that's going to expire tomorrow. It's uh, six, but gives you a hundred dollars off if you want to if you want to get the project. And then um, and then if you're using to get the code, just use Kevin. It's an easy one, easy one to remember. Um, and it, it'll show up for you. So um, I think that is probably all I have. Te Kevin, is my timing good on this? Oh, your timing's excellent. And uh, yeah, I, I gotta say, um, you know, you I've, I did John's course in, in Atlanta. Not only did we do the big house, but you start off inside a you know a studio and break out into groups, and you kind of light up the table stuff, and there's a lot of magic that I've discovered in photography along the way. Um, you know, the first time I saw a print get developed in the a tray. Um, and when I did the, my first light painting thing, you really, like John said, you can't really understand what you're doing because you're just lighting these little pieces with these little flashlights. And then you go into Lightroom and John's a very good teacher 
uh, of not Lightroom, but the Photoshop and bring the layers in and how to balance the lights and, and do all the works. And, and he does have actions that go with it. So it becomes a little bit easier. And after you've done two or three of them as small ones, then we went outside and we spent the whole evening doing this gigantic house with this car. And, um, you know, we had a camera guy who would push the button. John would run around with the light and we'd keep track of all this. And, you know, we, we waited for the sun to go down before we started. It was a lot, a lot of fun. And, you know, of course, that's a big shot. And once you get good, maybe you can do big shots. But, you know, you just, you know, when you have nothing to do on a snowy day or, you know, a rainy day or whatever it is, just, you know, get something out and, you know, play around with it. Um, his resource list, which he gave you the uh, URL to, gives you links to the flashlights and, you know, a bunch of these PVC modifiers and other things. I have a drawer full of them downstairs now. And, uh, you know, you just get them out and have some fun with them. And uh, it's... <laughs> Once you start doing it and, you know, you might do five or 10 layers on a small shot and then you start building up and then you can get your guts up and your courage up and invite some friends over with some beers and try to do your first house or car. Uh, it's, it's quite the experience. And um, so it was a lot of fun doing it with John. Anytime I'm with John, I always learn something new and um, it's quite exceptional. So what we'll do now is we'll open up the, uh, uh, the, the stuff for um, the, the, uh, the the questions and answers so if you have some questions put them on the chat john are you still there yeah i'll stop the share so that you can we can go from there how's that all right and, and john conicello if you would corsell would you be not kind enough to read off any questions that have popped up in chats and then those people just call the name and they can unmute themselves and ask the question directly yeah i don't think we got anything new we got thank you thank yous from rick and steven there and we answered uh david's question um can you show the award-winning Ferrari, Don, as the chick is asking? The Ferrari? Yeah, the... Oh, yeah, oh, the, one, um, the one you entered in 14 and and went to the Olympics with it. You yeah, didn't show no, it to it was, us. It was the Grand Image... When it was a Grand Imaging finalist. Uh, the Olympics actually was the one I did. The very first picture I showed in the... I don't know, come back here. I guess I can do it real quick. It's... Um, hmm, I can't share anymore. You should be able to share. I, oh, I can't see my... Uh, Oh, hold on a second. I got to I gotta find you again. Yeah. Hold on. He's still a co-host, so he should be able to share screen. It's just all, I don't have my desktop up to be able to share. Yeah, you got to just share your screen. Just go share screen again. Oh, okay. Let me try it again. Oh, share screen. Here we go. There. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's see. I'm sure. going to. Here we go. Okay. I'll find it real quick for you, Don. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Jeff, you had a question. You had your hand raised. Did you want to say something while we're getting there? Well, um, yeah, a couple things. Um, I, I love light painting. I did my first light painting in RIT in the. Uh, middle 1970s where we painted a building and I thought that was pretty cool. The The one thing that I was going to say is that uh, a lot of people that are looking at the exquisite and very complex light painting that John does, you can do light painting on a very simple method just by having um, the ability to, you know, light something and then shoot it and then move the light a little bit and shoot it again and then combine those two images. Uh, so a lot of people, ah, I'll let John go ahead and take it over. But That's, I was gonna say a lot of people, uh, you can keep it simple and still do really remarkable stuff. And interesting now too, uh, I, I'm sure that other camera manufacturers have it now, but. I have I use the uh, Olympus uh, for my wildlife sh shooting the OM one and and they've got a, a thing called live composite where you can actually it only adds it, you can open your shutter and then just keep adding light and it keeps adding it to the photograph without overexposing the the background which is really fascinating I mean you can basically create a, a light painting on the fly with a single exposure which is pretty cool as well so this is the picture here. Um, I, uh, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. I was lighting it with scrims and all kinds of stuff. I would never do this now, but that was, you know, I had to create my own background. We did it in the guy's garage. Um, and so it, nothing 
I would never do something like this anyway. But that was anyway. That was the thing that that uh, um, that did that that won that uh, GIA a couple of years ago. And then um, then to answer your other question, the other let's see if I go back here to the first one. Oh, let's see. And. Uh, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a. I have to be able to get back to my first slide here, and I took off my my viewer. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Okay, um, this is the one that this this image here won the uh, went to to Singapore and was judged fourth in the world in the commercial uh, aspect. All right, and the what they call it the uh great world cup i guess world cup exposure the only thing that's the only thing that's cool about it is i got a, a really neat jacket out of the deal <laughs> we got some other questions coming in yeah. claudia is asking can you explain the seven stop difference again sure if you uh th there's a real good way to illustrate it i'll unshare here again there's a real good way to 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 uh, illustrate this and that is if you are in a situation where you, let's say you're outside and you are, you want to try to light paint, let's uh, some kind of a thing, maybe a motorcycle. Okay. So you take your light and you run it across the, the, the bike from front to back, and it might take eight or nine seconds to do that. Okay. If you do that, and then you see lots of ambient light behind you, you have to wait till it gets darker because the ambient light is what, when you start brushing in the areas around the bike, for example, the top of the bike, if there's ambient light in the background, it's going to show through. And so you're going to have to do like masking and or, or you know using a pen tool to mark your, create a, these uh, clipping paths. You don't want to do all that. You just if it's a totally black background, you can brush willy nilly around the area, and it's not going to nothing is going to show. Does that make sense? Who asked that question? Yeah, that I mean I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to Paul's in a minute, but Claudia says yes. Uh, Jan Twyford is live composite. Is that a software? No, that is that that I just mentioned is available on. Yeah, you know, I don't know how far back it goes in the Olympus cameras because I'm not a. I just I've only had one for since the OM one. I might have might just be there starting on the OM one. Um, it's just that's a still, it's a it's gimmick. It's a it's firmware of the camera. Yeah, it's it's a it's another one. They have a whole bunch of, you know, they've got they've got uh, their their latest camera now has a um, uh, a, a digital um, live ND filter, um, and you can also do a, a graduated live and graduated filter, which is pretty slick. You can move it up and down. You can angle it. You can soften it. You can change it from one stop, two th stop, three stop. This is you know it's stuff that you can do that's that's in camera that's a little bit um you know you you can still do it without the cam without that dip, but you have to do it manually so you know it's, it's just a fuss factor you don't need to bring filters with you <laughs> yeah. but live composite well, is to uh, my knowledge yeah. i don't know if anybody else has it but if they don't they will the the feature you're talking about is you, you ask some guy at a camera store to give you a demo because as you're doing the exposure you just watch it build up so that you know you know when you've got the shot so it's pretty yeah, cool it, what they're doing and and you wonder why nobody else is doing it when you you know olympus can do it why can't right right there? well and and they they uh you know i've seen it done with really cool for like street scenes at night because what ends up happening is if you've got a let's say you're going to photograph times square there's there's lights that are 10 times brighter than other lights but what happens is it stops the exposure stops and so you can, you know, everything else just keeps building up so that you have this perfectly exposed uh, night scene, whereas you'd have to do all kinds of multiple exposures and masking and, and um, uh, um, uh, you know, tr trickery to try to get that. And it's all done in camera. So it's pretty slick. And I think there's well, a few apps on the iPhone that allow you to do it like Reflex and yeah, a few others. Yeah, iPhone does the same thing. And, the, you know, yeah. iPhone does what Olympus does with the, you know, you can hold your camera and you get the moving right. water and stuff using the live. I mean, Olympus does that too. You know, you can make 15 second exposures handheld and the water in the waterfall is moving, but the light, leaves are frozen. It's just crazy how they do yeah, that. Yeah, it blends all the exposures together. It's, it's quite unique. And you wonder why when... 
the iPhone's got it and Olympus has it that, you know, Sony and Icon and some of yeah. these others aren't trying to do the same thing because it's all basically firmware and software. Well, they will. It's just yeah. like the global shutter. Eventually, all, everybody will have a global shutter. You sure, know, so. sure. Yeah. Um, Any other next questions? question is from Paul Wicker. Do you create a storyboard of the items you want to light? Um, good question, Paul. I, I don't, but when I do my workshops, I have students do that. I try to make sure that they... They know what they're doing in, in advance because especially as you're first getting going, you know, you really don't like I did with that Ferrari. I had no idea what I was doing. So I shot 150 photographs just to make sure something was going to eventually, you know, throw it again, enough stuff against the wall. Something's going to stick. And, you know, that's not very efficient. So ideally what you want to do is to, you know, have an idea about what you want to do and then, you know, make the, uh, make the adjustments based on, you know, what you've, what you have it either have in mind or else have actually taken the time to write down. So that's a good question. One, uh, just uh, John, what, what I learned and, and did recently was um, took my iPad out when I did one of these and took a shot with the iPad and then went into the um, annotation part where I could just draw around it. Like we've seen like Ansel Adams oh, yeah. used to draw on his contact prints and, mm -hmm. you know, circle a tire or circle a steering wheel and all basically you know, made notes of where I wanted to make sure exposures were done. And um, that was a good way to make sure, because once you did them, you could change the ink on the pen and then just kind of like cross them out so that, you know, you're you're not forgetting something. And as you said, all you got to do is forget the one thing, like the interior of the car, but forgot to light the steering wheel. And, you know, right. now you got everything looking great, but somehow or rather the, the steering wheel's black, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the other advantage of that base exposure that I was talking about. You know, it, even though you're underexposing that to show maybe, you know, the, the scene of, in the foreground and background, just slightly like it's at night, but still visible, you can also reprocess that file at normal exposure. And if you have to, you can use that to, you know, to, to fill in your, your, uh, um, your your missing hubcap or whatever it is that you're doing as well. So that really is that the that saves your bacon. That saved my bacon a number of different times. Uh, that base exposure. Yeah. Seriously, if if you have the opportunity, take John's uh, workshop course if you're having any. And if not, I'll 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 talk to John again. Maybe we were going to do one in 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 Indianapolis here before we got pandemic and all that stuff. We might have to do that again now that we've got a better facility. So um, that's something we'll, we'll think about, but he also has those great videos he gave you the codes for, check those yeah. out. And if, yeah, if you get the videos, um, you can apply the full value that you paid for the videos toward the workshop. So, or if you just say, I wanna just do new the workshop, then you get the videos right away. So it's, you don't really pay for them either way. I mean, you kind of do, but you don't. But uh, the, I, I just think uh, I, there's a secondary benefit to that for me as a teacher is that, you know, if you've, if you've come to the, the workshop you we got the videos they've been watching for a couple of months. I've gotten you halfway trained already, so I don't have to start from you know from from square one, and it, and you have all the tools and everything, so it makes it a little bit easier for me on my end. So there's a method to the madness. <laughs> there is, but you know it's and it actually is somewhat madness when you're actually doing it because it's like oh, you can't yeah. really believe how it turns out when it's done, and uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, a lot of fun. It's still fun. I won't do anything in photography now, but it isn't fun. That's the, uh, that's the baseline word. It's her mantra. Yeah. Cause otherwise, uh, you know, then it's a job, right? Oh, a job. <laughs> I had a, I had a, 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 a friend of mine has a John Deere a tractor collection, antique John Deere tractor collection. I photographed him several of them now, and they've been on, he sends them into the cover of this magazine called green, which is the, uh, antique john deere collectors magazine some guy called me after the first cover was published and he says i have 47 tractors in southern illinois i'd like for you to photograph i said i'm sorry but i don't want a job <laughs> <laughs> i can find somebody who can do it for you maybe but i'm not going to do it that's it no so anyway yeah, yeah. That's cool. hey, dave, dave lawrence said i should hold we should go to the indianapolis speedway and um god have you never been there that place we'd have a blast doing some stuff oh yeah there. well you know, you just have to know the right people. That's all yeah, that matters. I know some people. We, we can okay. do it. All right. all right. Let's do it then. That'd be fun. So I got a question from Ralph about the softness of the light, like a soft box. How do you achieve that? So it's, that's really the difference between the strobe and the continuous light. So by using the wand and moving it, how are you creating a soft box effect? 
Right. And the fact that you can get that light in very, very close, because remember, you're you're cutting it out in the photograph. You can't do that with a softbox because the softbox can only go as close as you can get without it being in the in the picture. Whereas here I can I can have that that small light moving it across. It can be four or five inches away from, let's say, the, the fruit or whatever that I'm doing or two inches away from it is not in the picture. So even though it's a small light, I mean, it's not a matter how big the light is. It's a matter how big and close it is. The closer it is, obviously, the bigger the light spread will be. And one other thing that happens that doesn't happen with soft boxes, and this is a technical thing that some of you guys will figure out and understand, and and uh, and uh, especially if you're a technoid about this. But it, you know, if you have a, a large source of light, like a soft box, you're going to have a very soft fall off of, of the shadows. With this, even though you're making a creating a very soft light, because that light is very close to the subject, it creates a hard fall off. The shadows go that go dark very quickly. And that allows for a lot of manipulation to the lighting in ways that you couldn't do it with a very large source where you're basically stuck with the shadows that you're given. And uh, so that also makes it fun. And that, that may be a little hard to comprehend, but as you start doing a few of these, you realize I'm not, this is just totally not possible in any other way. <laughs> it's just really not in, impossible to do. So it does make it fun because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing light differently than you normally, than you ever have before. Really, really. It's just a whole new way of, of, of seeing and creating that just fascinates me every time I do it. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to do it again. I have a, on a project we're doing at Texas school. I think I have an electric Rolls Royce that we're going to do that. That'll be, <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. That's I can well, plug it into my lights. in. doesn't work. Yeah, that's it for the questions in chat. Anyone hey, else want to? Is, is Jeff? Um, when Rochester used to do this every year, you said they did it when you were there. But you know, they lit up aircraft carriers and oh yeah, giant... yeah. Not too long ago, they had a big painting uh, with light um, thing at Photo Expo where they lit up a, an entire aircraft carrier. Yeah. The uh, uh, the the weird thing is that it's. Uh, you talk about pre-visualization. There are things that you can do to kind of predict what it's going to look like and do things like that on a massive scale. But a lot of times it's it's like pure creative fun. Uh, you, you can kind of uh, pull stuff right out of thin air uh, because you could photograph, you can create a photograph that couldn't be photographed any other way. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it becomes quite unique. The other thing I was going to mention now, in, in the 1980s, when I was a commercial advertising photographer in Chicago, there was a fellow by the name of Aaron Jones. Yeah, the hose master guy. The hose master. <laughs> and I, he, you know, I don't know, it's like 10 grand or something to get the whole uh, hose master light painting thing. Uh, but in this day and age, with these little LED lighting, even the battery operated, if you're not, um, you know, needing uh, hours of, of uh, recording time uh, and you're shooting relatively small scenes, these, or just even an LED flashlight. Now, there was one question that was in uh, uh, regarding the, how soft the light looks. And there's a... a uh, an explanation for that, but I'd, I'd like to hear why you think that lighting looks so soft. Well, first of all, the most important part of it is that the light is very placed very close to the subject. Yep. So it is in a, apparently large just because it's that close. You know, when I, if that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, and then secondly, you're moving that light. So it's not just the single light with a fixed position that's creating the the shadowing, for example, you're dragging that light across the subject in a way that makes it appear to be a much larger light than it is. So instead of having a static image with a single shot, you're making a, a moving light source, which creates the illusion of a much larger light source with that sharp, and yet still with that sharp fall off. And so that's the difference and that's what makes it. And I think if I can share one more time 
Go this, right ahead. There is, uh, let's see, where would I find that? Here, I'll go here. Um, oh, I'm just going to go to, I'm just going to go to my, what, are you, am I, oh, I'm not there yet. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go to, um, this is my light painting website here. Okay. So uh, here we go. And here we go. And I'm going to go to the, this is that light lighting kit I was telling you about. Okay, so the this little thing right here, there it is. Okay, um, this this light right here is about this D this E tech light literally is about four inches long. Okay, but what Harold Ross has done is he's created this little adapter here that fits over the top of it, and then you and the, 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 the these little um, diffusers snap on. And they're beveled. It's hard to see. It looks like they're straight on, but they're actually beveled at an angle so that the light doesn't bounce back into the lens. And you can get it super, super close. And it, it because the light comes in and it's not a hot light, like this white would be a very, very big and bright hot light. Here, it's a very, very soft light that you move across the light. And it creates, um, you know, the, the photograph that I had that was the... Um, I think one of that first of those first still lifes that I showed. Um, there, let's see, this one here. Okay, this, you know, that was created with, entirely with that little light, and you can you can see. Let's say on the on the on the bread here, you know, it's a very soft light, and yet look at that hard fall off there. See, that's just not doable any other way. And you can add just as much fill light, for example, on the on the broken bread here. And then add just as much hot light here as you want without it blowing it out. And, and you can do the same thing here. You know, I just take a light and I just drag it across, move it up here like this, move it, oops, move it over to the top. And um, and then you can do the same thing here. You know, you create this kicker light on this side, one light in here. This is the main light uh, illusion here. You know, so all of th this whole thing was done with that little bitty tiny light. Yeah, really, really, really cool stuff. Um, we, we're we're moving on to a you know a little over the time limit here, so I know some people need to move on and go elsewhere. This is normally the time where we kind of open up the the forum for everybody. Uh, John, anything last you want to share with us before we stop the recording and just kind of open it up for general uh, discussions and so forth? Uh, no, Kevin. Just other. Just it's always good to good to see you guys. See you again, and 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 you know, uh, I've got neighbors and friends here that are here on the show, and some students, and it's just and clients I haven't seen in twenty years. So yeah, it's, it's I see that Paul Wicca was here. Gosh, you know, yeah. asked back from the Burrell days, and yeah. you know, those good yeah. old days, man. <laughs> That's right. Hard to believe. <laughs> We had a lot yeah. of fun at your your workshops too. Those those Vegas things every year were just uh, incredible good time. So. Um, lots of good memories. Yeah. And, yeah, it was fun. And they were, they had their time. That's yeah, for sure. they, they did for <laughs> sure. And, um, you know, our, we had a mutual friend, Don Feltner, who we used to go out and hang with and do all sorts of things. Yeah. It was a lot of, yeah. a lot of fun back then. And so exactly. I'm glad we've been able to stay in touch and from my heart and from everybody, I, I know I speak to everybody who was on online today. Thank you very much for, uh, doing such a great presentation, top notch. Um, I hope some of you are excited about the possibilities of what you can do with light painting and, you know, think small, start small and work your way up and you'll be doing rooms, you'll be dealing tabletops and eventually you might even try to do your own car and uh, when I can learn how to do it better I'll take out my private jet and shoot that. There we go. <laughs> okay. All so, right. Thanks um, again, Kevin. Good. Let me stop the recording and then we can just kind of go out. Everybody can unmute themselves and if anybody wants to share anything, uh, they can. Hold on. I'm stopping recording.